Okay, good morning, everybody, and good evening for those of you in Europe. Uh, I want to introduce everyone to the July 16th meeting of the Declinism Seminar. Uh, and I wanna just let everybody know a bit about what the seminar is and how the seminar is working. Um, the seminar is a joint activity by the UC San Diego uh, Center for Atlantic Studies and the Université de l'Estudio uh, de Firenze. Um, and it is designed to focus on questions of what decline means in antiquity across all of antiquity. Uh, and this is a, every few weeks we get together uh, with people from both of these institutions, but also from around the world to talk about these concepts and think about them in a new way. And it's a great pleasure today uh, to welcome Michelle Salzman, who will be speaking about resilience and resurgence or decline and fall, Rome in the fifth century. Uh, and it's especially interesting because this is, of course, connected to the appearance of Professor Salzman's new book, The Falls of Rome, Crises, Resilience, and Resurgence in Late Antiquity. And I wanted to share this flyer simply because I know many of us are very interested in this book. And so uh, this gives us a discount code if you're interested in purchasing the book in advance. Uh, and it gives you, well, a little bit of time to to see what she's talking about and then jump on buying the book. So um, I, for a formal introduction to Michelle Salzman, I, I want to turn things over to my colleague, uh, Giovanni Ciccone, and he will give our introduction to Professor Salzman. Yes, mm, it's uh, with great pleasure. And, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. It is with uh, great pleasure that I take on the task uh, of introducing a colleague and friend of my many years, Professor Michel René Zatzman of the University of California at Riverside. As a personal note, I remember well, and perhaps Michel too, that we first met more, unfortunately, than 20 years ago uh, at the American Academy of Rome. And it was the American Academy that Michelle had already been a fellow and there she was recently board of trustees for the Council of the School of Classical Studies. But of course I could mention other important awards for her and several visiting professorships and fellowships. In Riverside, by the way, I had in May 2019, a few days after our beautiful first uh, annual workshop uh, with friends and partner in San Diego, I had uh, the, uh, the opportunity to participate uh, in a seminar on religion and history in late antiquity together with other Italian friends and colleagues who are perhaps here today. Michel Salzman is among the most important international specialists of late antiquity, which she approaches at various levels and angles, which often lead back to the great questions of the place of Rome and the senatorial, senatorial aristocracy in the fourth and fifth centuries, of the relations between politics and religion, between pagans and Christians, and generally speaking of social history of the later empire. Among her uh, numerous publications, I would like to mention, renouncing to mention so many essays and articles, only some of her books. From her doctoral thesis, PhD in Bryn Mawr College, she published a very fascinating and new methodologically new book on Roman time, the Codex Calendar of three, uh, 354 and the Rhythms of Urban Life in Late Antiquity, University of California Press, uh, 1990. Her second books, book was The Making of a Christian Aristocracy, Social and Religious Change in the Western Roman Empire, Harvard University Press 2002. Then she worked to the letters of 
Sima, whose uh, the translation, translation commentary for the book one in 2011. She is senior editor of the Cambridge History of Religions in the Ancient World, volumes one and two, Cambridge University Press 2013. And she edited with uh, Marianne Segui. Uh, she, I think she's no more with us and Rita Lizzi Testa, Pagans and Christians in Late Antique Rome, Conflict, Competition and Coexistence in the First Century, and New York, Cambridge University Press, 2015. And then we know she kindly anticipated it to me and we have seen that the book of her is about to come out that could be perfectly consistent with the theme of these San Diego Florence lectures of ours, the falls of Rome, crisis, resilience, and resurgence in late antiquity, Cambridge, maybe Cambridge University Press, yes, but August or somehow later than August, but September, October 2021. And uh, uh, Professor Salzman has other projects on, on side. She kindly anticipated me as well. A research, a research on the acts of Sylvester in fifth century Roman liturgical practices. A paper on mixed marriages, imperial women and barbarian kings as part of a larger study of, a larger study of the late Roman family and other projects and ideas. So we are all looking forward to hearing your lecture today. And, uh, but before I yield the floor to you, I think it's right before this, uh, I would just like to recall the recent loss of a distinguished uh, great scholar of the ancient and late ancient world, Professor Lelia Krakorugini. Uh, to whose magisterium goes the grateful thoughts of all of us. So I give you, I yield the floor to you, Michelle. Well, thank you so much, Giovanni. Um, and I am uh, saddened by the loss of Lady Krakowicini. She was a, 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 a really a shiny example um, in so many ways. And she, um, her loss is really deeply felt um, across continents. Um, so uh, I want to also th thank you, Giovanni. I, I do remember meeting you um, at the American Academy in Rome, uh, and it's been a real pleasure to be here today. Um, thanks to this seminar that you and Ed Watts have co-organized. It's a, it's a great honor to be here. And the topic is uh, couldn't be more timely for, for my own thoughts. So I, I appreciate the invitation. And I am very happy to see so many familiar, uh, at least names uh, and some faces, I think. Um, so thank you all for coming out um, in, in California. It's morning, but in, in Europe, I know it's late. So I'm going to uh, share the screen, share my screen um, and talk to you today uh, about uh, really, um, it's a, a section or a chapter um, of my forthcoming book, um, which, uh, as Giovanni says, represents um, um, many uh, strands of my thinking, both about senators, Rome, pagans, Christians, and of course, de decline and fall. Um, but uh, having lived through the pandemic, I think, uh, then certainly um, you can all appreciate, uh, and, uh, and I have come to appreciate, not simply decline and fall, but resilience and resurgence. And that indeed is um, the topic of my talk today, resilience and resurgence or decline and fall Rome in the fifth centuries, in the fifth century, right? Um, so uh, I'll begin the talk. Uh, so in the with, well, some familiar figures. For centuries, scholars have 
uh, historians have engaged in a lively debate about the utility of Edward Gibbon's paradigm of decline and fall to describe the last centuries of the Western Roman Empire. Books like that of Brian Ward Perkins, provocatively entitled The Fall of Rome and the End of Civilization, published in 2005, these books have periodically revived Gibbon's interpretive framework by emphasizing the Germanic invasions as the quote, end of civilization. This catastrophist approach perspective is famously at odds with an alternative understanding by historians like Peter Brown and Alan Cameron, the late Alan Cameron. Since the 1970s, these continuists have argued for the ongoing vitality of Rome's legal and cultural institutions, and especially innovations in religion. Most recently, a third perspective has emerged. Scholars such as Jack Goody and Mark Humphreys have dismissed these paradigms as no less than the quote, Western theft of history, end quote. And they focus instead on large scale developments throughout the ancient world within a larger comparative framework. In my view, none of these approaches captures the creative resilience of this period. The impact of individual and collective choices during these pivotal three centuries is significant. So to move beyond these three well-known narratives, I focus instead on the elites who contested to rebuild Rome the city and its empire, following military and political disasters with particular attention to the Roman senatorial aristocracy. I've chosen to focus on the city of Rome and not on a subset of cities or on the Western Roman Empire writ large because Rome's influence had shaped the outlines of its Mediterranean empire. In late antiquity, Rome was still the largest city in the Western Mediterranean and an imperial capital with the resident aristocracy and prestigious institutions that had enabled Romans to rule an empire since the third century BC. The city remained in late, into late antiquity, in the words of Robert Marcus, the head, center, and sum of the world. So in my forthcoming book, I examined five political and military crises that ancient and modern historians have considered critical for understanding the decline and fall of Rome. By focusing on these crises, on how these crises led Romans to act to recover their city, I offer an alternative perspective for understanding the last three centuries of the Western Roman Empire, its imperial city, and its senatorial aristocracy in particular. Although the fortunes of Rome's leaders ebbed and flowed in a city which suffered population loss and reduced resources, the senatorial aristocracy remained at the center of the city's recovery. The resilience of Roman senatorial aristocrats who time and again used their resources to fuel the city's resurgence in the midst of loss is both significant and moving. It's a very definition of resilience used by historians like Kyle Hopper. To fully understand the resilience of the Roman senatorial aristocracy, we have to take into account the fact that they were themselves the products of a culture in which competition for influence and prestige acted as a stimulant. Crises brought about changes in the late Roman world that rendered politics in the late antique city more diffuse and variable. Personal relations played an even greater role than they had previously in winning power and building social networks that enabled material and political advantage. This competition energized rather than enervated senatorial aristocrats during the last three centuries of the Western Empire. At times it's true that their actions led to disaster. Sometimes they failed, but their intervention also allowed for the recovery of urban life and society, both of which have been overshadowed by the assumptions that come with alternative paradigms for understanding the end of late antique Rome. So to give you some sense of the resilience and resurgence of Roman senatorial aristocrats in relation to other elites, um, uh, both of which are often understated by those who write the history of the city and its empire, I'm going to turn now to a particular time and crisis. Uh, that is next. Okay. 
did. Um, 476. <laughs> 476, where the emperor rhymed as Augustus, is the conventional date for the fall of the Western Empire. Indeed, Edward Gibbon thought he might end his narrative there, based on it being the exile of the 14-year-old boy emperor Romulus, later called Romulus Augustulus, the last emperor in the West. But 476 is misleading. In my view, the crisis that emerged in 470 which culminated with the Civil War of 472, was arguably the most devastating fall of the city in the fifth century. The fighting divided families as well as the population at large, and it wrecked significant damage on the urban landscape. Nevertheless, the willingness of senators to return to Rome and to work with the General Ricimer led the groundwork for the resurgence of the city. In the aftermath of the Civil War of 472 and by 476, senatorial aristocrats had reunited to restore the city and its institutions, that is the Senate and the church. Senatorial aristocrats took advantage of their opportunities after the Civil War and strove to rebuild society with or without an imperial presence. At the same time, aristocrats continued to shape the religious contours of the church and society. As senatorial aristocrats crafted a new working relationship after the Civil War, they indeed short, they sought to shape the religious life of the city. In particular, they sought to limit the financial abuses of the papacy. These actions thus undermined the bishop's claims to dominance in Rome. Finally, aristocratic responses to 472 enabled the rise of a Germanic kingdom in Italy by 476 with senatorial aristocrats willing to hold the same high offices that, it, that would enable them to govern Italy on behalf of their new rulers, just as they had earlier for Roman emperors. So I'm going to uh, spend a little bit of time going over what happened in 472 and why it was important for the transformation of Rome. To get some sense of the, uh, how life had changed in the late fifth century city, I think a map of the empire is useful. By 454, the Western Empire was reduced to mostly Italy and sections of Gaul. The Vandals, um, an Aryan group, had established themselves in, um, in Africa um, in a kingdom that they would then later expand after the attack of Rome in 455. The Swears were in um, the Western part of Spain. Britain was lost. However, the Eastern Empire focused on Constantinople was intact. The shrinking of the Western Empire in the fifth century with its renewed focus on Italy placed even greater emphasis on the city of Rome. Although emperors had in the early fifth century resided in Milan and Ravenna, in the 440s and 450s, emperors and generals had returned to Rome seeking stability and the support, I argue, of Roman senatorial aristocrats. In 470, the, uh, the then emperor uh, Procopius uh, and Themius resided in Rome. An experienced general, uh, he was um, a Greek who had been sent by the Eastern emperor Leo to help secure the peninsula on the eve of a major attack on the Vandals. The Senate's acceptance of Anthemius was based in part on the continuing ideal of shared rulership between the East and the West. Of course, Anthemius also brought with him a good number of troops and gold, winning the support of a number of senatorial aristocrats who took high office under his rule. Some also supported his more open religious policies. We hear of his attempts to control the finances of the Bishop of Rome, and to put in place some greater tolerance of religious diversity. As a return to Rome of several Christian sects, as well as the pagan Neoplatonist, Messius Phoebus Severus indicates. The key military figure in the West was Ricimer, a German by birth who had spent his career at the top echelons of power in the service of Rome. Although scholars wonder why Ricimer accepted this Greek emperor rather than usurp authority, I argued that this resolution was a good one in his eyes. 
Ricimer retained control of his troops while the East sent troops to fight the Vandals. Ricimer also gained a wife, the daughter of Anthemius, and their children would bring Ricimer a formal role in dynastic succession. Contemporaries saw his authority in Italy as second only to the Emperor Anthemius. In short, Ricimer could do what he wanted without the formal title of Emperor. But the arrangement didn't last. The expedition against the Vandals failed, as did Anthemius' attempt to curb an uprising in Gaul. Tensions between the general and the emperor grew. When Anthemius grew dangerously ill, he alleged a conspiracy by friends of Ricimer, and then Anthemius executed them without a trial. The seventh century Greek historian John of Antioch, using sources that we no longer have, tells us in his anger that, quote, Ricimer left Rome and summoned 6,000 men who were under his command for the war against the Vandals. Ricimer went north to Milan and then proceeded to call in support from other barbarian kings as he took control over northern Italy. The stage was set for civil war. Negotiations failed and Ricimer marched on Rome and siege Anthemius within the city for a period of at least five months, starting likely in October 471 and continuing through July 472. Anthemius was not the first to rely on the walls of Rome against such an attack. On his side were those in authority, as John says, Hoite and Tele, senators, magistrates, and their retainers. We don't have exact numbers from our sources, but one pro Anthemius source does add that the population at large, the demos, supported the emperor. Aristocrats were divided in the civil war. Some scholars, uh, Giovanni Zacchini and Umberto Roberto, have argued that they divided based on Rome's two families, the Anicii and the Dicii. The Anicii being pro-barbarian, pro-Christian, anti-Eastern versus the Dicii opposing them on all grounds. But as we shall see, um, I find little evidence for this view after 472. Um, so my work supports that of Alan Cameron's that sees politics not being divided along family lines quite so neatly. Rather, this was a civil war, as our sources call it, with Diki and Aniki, as well as aristocratic supporters on both sides. Both sides relied on mercenaries. Anywhere from 10 to 20,000 men fought for Ricimer, and probably a somewhat similar number for Anthemius. The fighting in 472 was more destructive to the urban fabric than the most more famous sack of Rome in 410. Then the Gothic leader Alaric had entered the city without a battle, and as an Arian, he didn't slaughter the inhabitants. But in 472, the city became a battlefield. Ricimer camped across the Tiber River here, uh, here uh, uh, as you all know, uh, in, uh, and he was also in Trastevere. Um, uh, he controlled the supplies of the cities and starved the city for many months. And Thamias and his supporters, including his bodyguard, resided in the palace on the Palatine Hill. Paul the deacon describes one key battle as a site identified with the, with the Pondalius here, um, uh, near the tomb of Hadrian, which Ricimer had turned into a fortress, Pastel San Angelo. Anthemius's men fought valiantly, but they lost. When the emperor Anthemius tried to flee, he was caught inside the church of San Crisogono in Trastevere and beheaded. The result, as Paul the deacon writes later, was that Rome was devastated first by hunger and disease, and then was, quote, gravely ravaged by the greed of the looters except for the two areas of Rome where Wickham's men had resided. That is in Trastevere and in the Vatican area. In the aftermath of this crisis, which one late fifth century Pope called Cumulus Furor, civil madness, Roman central and military elites acted quickly. The senators who survived returned to Rome and lent their support to the general Wickhamer and the man whom he would designate to be the next um, emperor, Anicius uh, Olibrius. Olibrius was a leading senator from Rome who went east after the Vandal sack of 455 and was eastern consul in 464. 
As a member of the wealthy Enlikian family, perhaps the third most powerful one in Rome, he was sent by the Eastern Emperor Leo to try to mediate the civil war between Anthemius and Ricimer. Instead, Ricimer enticed Olivius to take the throne. Indeed, Olivius married to the daughter of the former Emperor Valentinian III and with ties to the Vandal King Geyseric was an excellent choice to reunite a divided aristocracy and at the same time gain legitimacy for the new regime. The willingness of sentences to return soon after 472, rather than to retreat to their estates in Italy or to go east, was one key to their continuing influence. Senators had learned from past crises. Just 17 years earlier, senators had similarly returned quickly to Rome after the sack of 455 to support Majorian. And then again in 465, after Majorian's demise, senators had returned quickly to support Ricimer's candidate, the senator Libius Severus as I uh, demonstrated in an article published in Antiquity Tardif. Ricimer's preference for senators as emperors had long been acceptable to Rome's aristocracy. Once again, now, after the Civil War of 472, Ricimer sought their support. And it's worth emphasizing that neither he nor Olivius took any action against those aristocrats who had sided with Anthemius. Moreover, Ricimer and the Senate granted Anthemius an appropriate state funeral and burial, waiting until his burial before taking residence in the palace on the Palatine, at least according to one source. Such actions facilitated the reunification of the aristocracy behind the new government of Olibrius and Ricimer. Even after Ricimer's totally unexpected death in August 472, just 40 days after the death of Anthemius, the senators continued to support Ricimer's successor, his nephew, the Burgundian noble Gundabar. And the senators continued their support for Gundabar's government after the unexpected death of Olibrius in November of 472. The Senate um, confirmed Gundabar's candidate as emperor, Glycarius, commander of the imperial bodyguard in March of 473, 474. So in the aftermath of 472, a unified Senate allied with the military and started the work of restoring the city. And an inscription from the Roman Forum in the area identified as the Atrium Minerva, also called the Falcidium, supplies important evidence for the resilience of Roman elites in the aftermath of 472. Indeed, the restoration took place in an area pregnant with symbolic meaning the atrium Minerva, uh, was a porticus or a vestibule in front of the Senate house. Um, and, and along with the statue of the goddess um, it had been, that had been dedicated by Augustus. The inscription uh, records the blessing by the urban prefect, uh, the, excuse me, the restoration by the urban prefect who advertised the return to quote, a blessed age uh, in, in, uh, in this inscription, which is dated to 472, 473. Uh, uh, the inscription, uh, unfortunately, no longer survives, but it can be confidently reconstructed um, as here on the basis of manuscripts. So the statue or the simulacrum um, of Minerva, broken by a falling roof, destroyed by fire during a civic conflict, was restored by Anicius Achilles Aganantius Faustus of central status and aristocrat of the highest rank. The judge hearing imperial appeals, providing improvements and completing the work for the happiness of the age, pro beatitudine temporis. The restoration of a pagan statue by a man assumed to have been a Christian attests to reverence for the site as well as a revival of antiquarian sentiments among Roman senators, as Carlos Machado has argued. But I want to emphasize the emotions that led to the choice of the statue, called a simulacrum, which emphasizes the sacred nature of the deity and expresses reverence for Rome's past. The inscription also asserts what was a standard Mediterranean idea that disasters strike due to divine anger. And this is what is the cause of this recent civil conflict, Coelis 
tumultus, uh, tumultus Kirillus, a phrase that is reiterated in other references to 472. The prefect who undertook this work, Nicias Achilles Agonantius Faustus, belongs to the family of the Nicii, who would have a long, illustrious career under the Germanic rulers of the late fifth century. His restoration made a strong statement in favor of winning divine favor for a Senate now unified as a means of ensuring a quote, more blessed future. Faustus was not alone in his early support for the new regime. Most likely the Senator Petronius Pepena Magnus Quadratianus, a member of the Roman family of the Petronii, a urban prefect also repaired the Baths of Constantine, which was similarly damaged probably at this time um, in the devastation of a deadly calamity, is what it says. Anyway, in this period of restoration, upwardly mobile elites seized the opportunity for advancements, and some of them were welcomed into aristocratic society. The man chosen for uh, the Praetorian prefect of Italy, for example, one Felix Himelko, was most likely new to the aristocracy, based again mostly on his name. In the edict which he posted in Rome under Glagarius, he too expressed hopes for changes that would bring about the happiness, beatitudine, of a better time. Among the new men who were welcomed into aristocratic society were a number of military elites. In the years between 472 and 476, the German general Valila was on for the seat in the Flavian Amphitheater, a location reserved generally for senators. Revila emulated Roman senators and is known for having donated a church in Rome, following the patronage patterns of civic elites in this as well. Under the Emperor Glycarius, the senatorial aristocracy saw renewed limits on papal financial abuses by church officials, issues that had concerned senators since the late fourth century. Indeed, this had been a topic that had strained relations between Anthemius and the previous Pope. Just three years earlier, in 469, um, in a code that we have left um, issued by Anthemius and Leo, uh, uh, the sale of church office had been condemned in rather harsh language. Let the profane order of Everest cease to threaten our altars and let this disgraced crime be banished from our holy sanctuaries. Therefore, in our times, let chaste and humble bishops be selected. It's striking that the sole law, and I can give you the Latin here. It's striking that the sole law to survive from the Emperor Lycaris passed just days after taking office on March 473 reiterated restrictions on the sale of church office in similarly moralizing language that aimed to curb the actions of the then Pope Simplicius. Um, Glycarius's law is filled with righteous indignation, not just against bishops, but also against the clergy who follow them in this abusive practice. Um, and I'll just translate. From this practice, it has developed that secular power is valued more than reverence for priests, so that they, those who are called priests, prefer to be tyrants over citizens. Tyrannopolitas. Roman aristocrats had been concerned that such abuses would tarnish the moral authority of the bishop and clergy. And this fear is expressed by Glycaris, who not only condemned this practice as indecor cupiditas, dishonorable desire or greed, but also suggested that this had been brought on by divine anger that had led to the recent ills of the civil war. And his law continued, from which reason we believe it has happened that the deity was offended, which we recognize because we have suffered so many evils. Uh, who averted the favor of its majesty and wears out the Roman people with such great misfortunes which have thus transpired. Glycarius's explanation would appeal to a number of Anthemius's previous supporters, certainly blaming this recent civil strife on such moral abuses is a good way to explain the recent internal strife and would justify intervention in this sort of financial abuse. External controls on the financial abuses of the clergy may have been one other consideration that led the then Pope Simplicius 
to respond forcefully to financial abuses within the church in Italy. In his letter, dated 475, Pope Simplicius stipulated for the first time in the fifth century Church of Rome how the revenues to the church should be divided, the famous fourfold division of funds equally between bishop, clergy, church workers, and the poor. Simplicius's letter, written in response to the complaints of three Italian bishops, also addresses the concerns of aristocrats, that bishops and priests who sold off their charitable gifts thereby diminish their own salvation. And this concern uh, led to reiterating restrictions on church offices selling goods that were expressed openly by this Pope in the document known as the Scriptura of 483. The Scriptura of 483, or the testament, testamentary will, um, according to Christina Sesser, also addressed concerns of wealthy donors that clergy not sell off their donated charitable goods. It is in many ways a natural outgrowth of these trends that under the Ostrogothic king in 530, the Senate also passed a consulta outlawing the sale of church office. So to summarize, after 472, Roman senators in alliance with military leaders worked to ensure the survival of Rome and supported weak imperial figures to that end. The weakening of imperial authority in the West set the stage for the removal of the emperor. When the new Eastern emperor Zeno sent his new candidate to the throne, General Nepos, Glacarius fled without a fight. In some sources, he was made Bishop of Salona, modern split in Pannonia. Clearly the throne was not worth dying for. The senators went along with a stronger military leader, but Nepos made several crucial errors from the perspective of the Senate. That is, he failed to build ties with the elites in Rome and he chose to rule from Ravenna. So when Nepos' general Orestes revolted in 476 and made his 14 year old son Romulus emperor, Nepos went into exile in Dalmatia. The Senate didn't stop him, nor did they support Romulus against the stronger and more politically savvy general Oriaca who had apparently been allied with some senators in Rome. Uh, in fact, a later historian, Malchus, tells us that in 476, Augustus forced, that, uh, that is, Lamus Augustus, forced Anacase, the Senate, to send an emperor, ambassador to the Eastern emperor, asserting that, quote, there was no need of a divided rule and that one shared emperor was sufficient for both territories. More than likely, the Senate took this action voluntarily because as the central ambassador in the Chronicle uh, says, quote, they had chosen Adoracar, a man of military and political experience to safeguard Suzanne so their things, their own affairs, pragmata and that Zeno should confer upon him the rank of patrician and trust him with the government of Rome. That is, they wanted him to protect not just their affairs, but also their goods, their pragmata, their property. In fact, the Senate did not mention Nepos at all. By denying Nepos's existence, the senatorial envies negated his legitimacy. They did, however, attest to their allegiance to the Eastern Emperor in an effort to forestall his intervention in Italy. Clearly, the Senate had been working behind the scenes to instigate the exile of one emperor and the retirement of another. Now working hand in glove with Odiaca to keep imperial oversight at a safe distance. The Eastern Emperor Zeno, only recently back in control of Constantinople, was not inclined to accept this arrangement, but there's little reason to suspect that the senators were unhappy with it. Indeed, if we look at the men who um, took positions uh, in this period, it's clear that some um, of them did quite well, and the typical senator aristocrats did quite well indeed. I have collected information for our civic office holders under Odiaker's 13 year rule. Um, six officers plus consulships from 480, that is after the death of Nepos, 
when, um, when they were recognized, that is after 46 or after 49. 16 of the possible 87 high civic office holders can be securely dated to the reign of Odiacre, or approximately one sixth of the total. Um, and uh, just a footnote, this group is certainly smaller than a recent study of the senatorial aristocracy because I omit um, the 12 or so other men who many scholars have included um, in discussions of Odiacre's rule because they have used the overly optimistic date of inscriptions from the Colosseum um, uh, that were used by Shastic Mill, which Sylvia Orlandi has shown to be not so, was not so reliable. Um, in any case, the men who held these positions shared certain characteristics and taken as a group, they point to some significant trends in how elite contestation for Olympus in Rome continued to fuel the recovery of the city and Italy in the 480s. I've only put up a few of them here that I could get on, I think, a legible screen. But it's clear the, uh, uh, in green, green and red, I put in the most established Roman families who are visible. Of the 16 men with positions or consulships securely attested under Odiacre, nine are from six powerful established Roman families, including the Dicii, the Anicii, the Simici, uh, the Petroni, um, uh, Achilles, Gladiones, and the Boethii. And if we assume them to be from another aristocratic family, the Severina family and one Italian aristocratic family, the Cassiodori. The Dicii, as several scholars have observed, did particularly well in this decade with three of their members holding high office um, in addition to three of the consulships. Uh, in contrast to other families, including the Amicii, held only one, or most in the case of the Petroni, two offices per family. But they are there, they're all there. Uh, so with this who's who of elite families is certainly smaller than in the early fifth century or in the fourth century, but the strong core of old families will survive into the sixth century as they are so attested under Theodoric. So conclusions. What I hope that this talk has demonstrated, as will my book, is the resilience and resurgence of senatorial aristocrats in alliance with military and papal elites to restore Rome as the center of political power in the fifth century. It became apparent to aristocrats in the wake of 472 that it was no longer desirable to have a Western resident emperor. The shared rulership model was no longer effective in securing their things, their pragmata. The civil wars and long periods over the course of the fifth century without a Western emperor had demonstrated that the Senate and senators could hold power, but they needed a strong military with whom to work to provide protection. When a new military elite emerged, Theodoric, they shut the gates on Odoacre and changed alliance in 489. While I have emphasized the resilience of Roman elites in response to this crisis, the catastrophist paradigm focuses on this same crisis and others um, as setting the city and its inhabitants on an ever downward, virtually unavoidable spiral. Uh, this approach, as I've argued, has underestimated the political and economic strength of Romans and their institutions, including the Senate over the long durée. So rather than dismiss the delegation sent in 476 from the Senate of Rome to the Eastern Emperor Zeno, the, the delegation which asserted that one emperor in the East was enough, rather than dismissing that as simply an ineffectual actions of a weak institution manipulated force by the Romulus or other, um, I argue that the embassy was an expression of the changed political goals of still powerful and still wealthy Western senators. Their decision to align themselves with Odoacre mattered. Yes, the city of Rome had declined in size. Evidence from excavations of elite housing in Rome as that on the Esquiline Hill, for example, as well as some texts that document charitable gifts to the church, indicate by the late fifth century, a number of large urban properties had been broken up into smaller units, reused for commercial purposes or donated to the church. Now these are significant transformations and they reflect change dynamics in the economic, political and social life of the city. 
some of these changes were the result of ruptures created by the political and military crises that we hear about from our late Roman writers. Because I want to take into account the harsh breaks created by certain crises, I cannot fully align with the continuous or transformationist paradigm either. Not all changes led to new or positive developments. The abandonment of certain villas or apartment buildings, for instance, is evidence that their owners either had died or had deemed rebuilding as a not viable option. The owners of the Escaline Treasury, for example, never returned to reclaim their wealth and social position. Yet, while Rome certainly changed and was smaller in population and resources in 476, it certainly didn't fall in 476, as Gibbon was well aware. When Nepos died in exile in 480, the senators and the Germanic general, Odiacre, had already been at work rebuilding Rome for some eight years. Odoacre, who chose to remove himself to Ravenna, acknowledged the dominant role of the central aristocracy in Rome. So too had the papacy seen the need to restrict financial abuses to ensure the ongoing support of Roman aristocrats. Simplicius's successor, Felix, had made close ties with them, even as I've argued in an article in Journal of Early Christian Studies, even marrying off his daughter to one of the Aniki. Aristocratic influence thus continued to shape Rome's religious identity. Despite the rhetoric in texts such as the Book of the Popes, the sixth century collection of papal biographies modeled on Suetonius' Lives of the Caesars, the bishops of Rome remained weak civic leaders through the end of the fifth century. Central aristocrats, patrons, and protectors of the bishops of Rome were able to assert stronger controls over what they saw as abuses by the bishop and church in the city. The dominant influence of central aristocrats in Rome in alliance with German military elites in Ravenna brought relative prosperity to Rome and its aristocrats, who are now firmly in charge of the city. It also benefited, I hasten to add, their retainers and non-elites whose lives were bound up with those in charge of the city. This happy state of affairs would continue under Odoacre's successor, Theodoric, and brought a period of peace in the late fifth and early sixth centuries until the intervention, again, of an Eastern emperor, Justinian. How a Roman elite survived Justinian's war reconquest is the subject of my uh, next to last chapter of my book, but that's a paper for another day. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, dear Michel, for your beautiful talk about this changing Rome uh, and uh, about, uh, about uh, these relations among different uh, elite, uh, military uh, and uh, senatorial uh, aristocracy. Uh, in the whole, there are colleagues that are much stronger than me on this period and on this topic. I just uh, would, would like to ask you a question. And, um, I would like to um, uh, stress that uh, as uh, Edward Watts uh, indicated in the chat, uh, we are used uh, to uh, book the interventions, uh, writing Q for questions, writing C for commentaries, comments. But uh, my question for Michelle, uh, concerns uh, just uh, it's just a curiosity you 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 talked for a second about the population of rome and uh, the small population of rome i was uh, wondering if you have never thought about uh, all those complex difficult calculations by Elio Locascio that I could not uh, repeat, but they were based uh, on uh, the number of uh, beneficiaries of uh, fermentaciones, the number of beneficiaries, beneficiaries of Caro Porcina, uh, on the insule mentioned in the regionaries. And uh, Locascio at the end uh, arrived to a very, my 
seem to me a very low estimations, uh, uh, something like uh, less than 50,000 inhabitants of Rome for the fifth and the beginning of the sixth centuries. So I was wondering if you have ever thought about this question, but uh, I am conscious that my question is not so directly connected to, to your paper. So maybe you can answer to this uh, in a second moment. And uh, perhaps uh, there are some questions I can uh, or comment. Daniel, I was, uh, I had seen Daniele Reano, the, the, Daniele, and uh, then uh, Professor yeah. Engels. Please, Daniele Reano. Thank you, Professor Aman, for this interesting uh, great moment of knowledge. Thank you also to Giovanni Alberto Cecconi and Edward Watts for organizing uh, this engaging cycle of conferences. Um, so, Professor Salzman, I have a question for you. Um, <clears throat> in the mid-fifth uh, century, the Roman aristocracy had the power to overturn Avitus and also Iron. Rome and the senatorial elite uh, were at the center of the political project of Antenio and was uh, a senatorial uh, embassy, embassy that went to Constantinople to request uh, that the Eastern Emperor you know, uh, appointed the Uh, I can't hear uh, Rianne anymore. Neither, neither can I. Okay, so we maybe can, he can uh, maybe he could type the rest of his question, and then we could go to somebody else. Yes, I would leave uh, to Professor Engels. If uh, do you want to intervene, please? Ah, thank you very much for the splendid talk. Uh, my question is only a, a brief one on rhetorical terminology. In one of your sources, you mentioned an accusation um, of priests as tyrants over citizens, tyrannopolitas. And I found this quite exceptional. Uh, and I would like, perhaps you could elaborate a bit on whether there are parallels in, in uh, certain genres of late antique uh, literature on this special term then, or is it a singularity then? Well, thank you. I, I highlighted it because it was so the, unusual, um, Tyrannopolitas. And the only other instance of it that I'm aware of uh, that, that we are that we have is um, is a letter of uh, Sidonius Apollinaris. Ah, yeah. And he's using it um, um, about uh, a, a Gallic official who is abusing people under him. Mm -hmm. So, so um, you know, so it is something that I've, I've thought about and, and the um, it's actually, uh, there was a translation of documents by Coleman Norton where they mistranslated, I think. They translated as um, uh, citizens who are tyrants, and I think that's wrong. No, um, no. So it's the other yeah. way around. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so good. I'm glad you agree. And so I think that it's very much, as, I've, as, I, as I argue, but that's the only other usage. So mm -hmm. um, it's very intriguing because, because it suggests that mm -hmm. like Curious maybe had some kind of connection with Gallic elites, but it's a very tenuous yeah. one at that. Um, mm -hmm. um, of course, the frequency of Tyrannus in, in the terminology of abusing you know, illegitimate rulers um, recurs. Uh, uh, that that we find very often in late Roman thinking, but it's interesting mm -hmm. to me because um, the penultimate chapter of the book looks at the um, pragmatic sanction, and uh, that term tyrannus is used of um, totilla, right? And you know, illegal. Mm -hmm. You know, more within a political framework. So 
Uh, and even in Sidonius's letter, it's within a political framework, not used for uh, church people. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a very distinctive term. So thank you for letting yeah. me dissert on it. If, if, yeah. if, if, you, if you find more examples, I, I, I can't, I don't think there are any that I know mm -hmm. of, so um, I would love some. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thanks. Thank you. thank you. Daniele Reano, maybe, uh, are you here? Can you uh, conclude your question or perhaps you are absent? Daniele doesn't answer. Well, I, I can say that um, I have delved into the population question, but it is a very thorny one. And um, mm -hmm. Elia Lukashev's um, uh, assumptions based on really the food dole to a large degree. Um, uh, I think the insulae uh, calculations are extremely unreliable because we, you know, we estimates mm. about how many people can fit into an apartment house. It's just, it seems that they're very so. Most of the conversation that I've seen, or that I that I've looked at, um, look at um, estimates based on the dole, and um, we just have very infrequent references. Um, we have the um, early fifth century, and then we have something from Cassiodorus um, under Theodoric. Um, and so um, I'm, I wouldn't trust my memory, but the numbers are, you know, certainly the population has decreased from, if you consider the late fourth century, anywhere between 700 to a million, you know, by the late fifth century, probably um, half that. But but I think uh, 30,000 is uh, way, way too small. Um, yeah, I think demand, so. I mean, I think that's an older estimate. And we just don't have any evidence about um, from pork distribution from the second half of the fifth century up until the time of Cassiodorus. And, the, and, and then, uh, and even then it's very unreliable. We have some, some assertions in, um, in uh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, we have uh, some um, information from um, the anonymous Felizianus. It's just very unreliable. I mean, it's certainly smaller, but how much smaller? I think it's really impossible to know. So, um, yeah. But even if it's a city of, uh, you know, 300,000, 200,000, you know, a hundred thousand. That's still quite a sizable city by ancient standards. Probably still the largest. There, there is something um, uh, in um, a reference to Rome being larger than Milan in the Gothic Wars. So, it's, but that's again, it's rhetoric. We don't. It's not really. Um, uh, Matt uh, Kufler, uh, uh, for a question, please. Hello, hi Michelle. Hi Matt. <laughs> I'm no C. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just a quick question is kind of tangential, but um, given the the kind of sense of solidarity and resilience that you talk about for the senatorial aristocracy within Rome, it sounds like Theodoric was correct to assume they were acting in concert against him. You know, in the assassination attempt of. The five uh, twenty-four. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. It's a little beyond what you were talking about today, but I'm just curious since I know your book is more wide-ranging. Hey. Uh, well, thank you for that question. Um, um, I actually don't think they were acting together. I mean, and Shane Bjorn was here. Uh, uh, he would probably have some ideas too. But um, I, I, uh, I. I am very much taken by the fact that um, towards the end of Theodoric's rule, he was, um, there were lots of plots um, about who would take over. And I think that they got uh, involved in them. And, and um, you know, his, the allegations that were raised against um, uh, Boethius uh, and, um, uh, and 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 Simicus, uh, 
had to do with internal fighting among the senators, which was then picked up and used by Theodoric, I think, um, as, uh, as he was concerned or as there were different shifting allegiances. So I don't see them as united against him in a, in a plot per se. I, it's more that this was um, a moment of political uncertainty and um, it seems it seems to me, um, and I, I discussed it a little bit in in, in the last uh, in the next last chapter, is that they were thought the senators thought that they could handle this dispute among themselves without uh, the uh, Theodore being involved. But he does get involved, and that's what's surprising. And um, he grows increasingly. He seems to be increasingly. Um, I don't know, paranoid or concerned about Arians, you know, so there's a lot of things that seem to be falling apart in his reign. Um, and I very much uh, see the senators, you know, having shifting alliances like, uh, like any elite groups, <laughs> I see senators today. I don't think the distinctions between um, the Miki and Biki were hardcore and resolute. You know, there was no pro versus anti-barbarian evidence in the civil war that I can see. Um, some people supported Anthemius, but then others uh, did not. So I think it really is a question of, um, uh, yeah, I don't see the, those kind of, you just don't have the evidence for it lasting long. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Thanks okay. for the question. There is, uh... There is uh, mm, a question. I, I, I should say that uh, we we see the, 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 the chat in, ch in the chat Daniele Reano, who continues to to explain his uh, question. Some connections, problem. Okay, how much this centrality of Rome in the mid fifth century depended on the fact that Rome was the most suitable site for coordinating the war against the Vandals and on the supremacy they were able to obtain over the Western Mediterranean. In other terms, setting aside the various pillages and looting that Rome suffered, how much did the regained centrality of Rome in the fifth century depend on the new political military geomorphology of the Western empires, et cetera, et cetera, you have understood. Maybe it's too long to read the all. Uh, well, Danielle, I'm sorry you can't even hear the audio now, but maybe you can hear the tape. But it's a great question. Um, uh, you know, I think it was the uh, the um, that had been the hope by sending. Leo uh, by sending um, Anthemius with his troops there, but Anthemius wasn't given the full charge of the war um, against the Vandals in the 450s, uh, excuse me, when he went in the 470s. So um, to some degree, it, it does have to deal, the Eastern support for the West is part of ongoing, the ongoing ideal of a unified empire for sure. Um, and that Italy remained critical from holding on to Africa. Yes, I think that's a, a very good point. You know, it, it was um, also, I think, you know, uh, uh, as, as it would be called under Justinian, you know, old Rome, you know, it still had um, a symbolic, um, as, but it also had a, a real um, position if they were going to reclaim Africa uh, then having Sicily and Italy, of course, would be very useful um, to the East. Uh, yeah. Okay. And uh, Edward, please. Hi, Michelle. Uh, I wanted to actually follow up on something that Giovanni's question and your answer kind of prompted in my mind. Um, and this is the, I guess, for lack of a better term, a kind of psychological tyranny of ruined spaces when you're in an, a major urban center and the population is declined and the physical infrastructure is visibly damaged. Um, I, I wonder if there is something about that condition creating an impetus for elites to step in um, because there's a way to, to emphasize a particular contribution. 
And I guess the idea that I have in mind is um, what Dan Gilbert, and to a lesser degree, um, one of the Ford heirs, has done in Detroit, where the space in the city was, in a sense, hollowed out. Um, and they came in with relatively little money and made a major impact on revitalizing the city. But it was you know, to their great kind of um, personal prestige that they did this. And I'm wondering if, if there is a kind of connection um, that we can draw in the activity of, of senators in the later fifth century and the kind of condition of the city as its physical infrastructure declines and its uh, population also declines. Does that make it kind of in a sense easier and also provide additional impetus for senators to step in and do this work? Um, or is that just simply something that our evidence doesn't allow us to trace? Thank you for that um, follow-up. Um, I, I do think there is something to the idea and you can see something of that in the development of imperial, um, excuse me, senatorial fora. Uh, in front of in front of houses, we hear about the forum of the Palmatii and the uh, various senators who build public spaces in front of their houses in Rome. Um, uh, so I know there is one uh, uh, one of Siagrius. We don't know exactly where it is on the ground, but it speaks to senators taking over what had once been public spaces and making them big open areas for statues, markets, whatever. So that's one, I think, and it happens in the fifth century. We don't see it before. Um, so that's one way of dealing with having more space in the city that's not being used for housing. So in some ways, the fourth century was a really hot housing market where I, um, we, we hear about a lot of building and here Carlos Machado's book, I think is very, is good on that. Um, and, and in the fifth century, we see these kinds of developments, which you could not, you couldn't see an individual aristocrat doing something like that, you know, building their own forum in, in front of their house as the Palmatis, uh, the Palmati family did, um, unless you know, unless there was available space you know, and people were willing to have this happen. So that might be one way. Um, but I do think that, uh, and we do hear about houses, big houses being divided up and you can see some of them. We have some archeological evidence. I cite some in my book um, uh, and Carlos Machado has, has much more, but there is one for instance, near the um, Escaline Hill, near the modern train station where uh, there was a large house that was carved up into smaller houses. And what's so interesting is that it continues to be used into the sixth century. So, you know, when I first work, started working on the center of aristocracy, I thought, well, by the fifth century, they all become Christian and they're bishops and that they all end. That's clearly not the case. And even housing, you know, we used to think, uh, I used to think, you know, they all just sort of fell apart with uh, the Vandal Sack or, or 410, but that's not the case. Um, but the reuse shows different, different ways of inhabiting the spaces. Um, and that's why I'm somewhat hesitant uh, to, um, to, you know, there is, a, there is more space out there, but also used for different ways. You know, one of the things that, um, that they could have used it for were for um, Xenodokia, right? For charity foundations. Um, and in, so the giving it to the church to use for charity foundations might be a way to also, um, you know, use up these spaces. The archeology span doesn't suggest new housing, but it does suggest reusing spaces in different ways. So I, I so, um, you know, so the feeling, I, I, I don't think it's so much like Detroit insofar as it's not all abandoned or destroyed. Um, it, there's a shrunken population, but from what we can see from the evidence, a lot of it is being used in different ways with less population, admittedly. And, and even 
um, gardens. You know, um, Carolyn Goodson's book talks about um, urban gardens, both uh, outside the walls of Rome, but also inside the walls of Rome. So you could also see that, you know, to supply some degree of food stuff. You know, uh, so you, you know, um, so I, I don't. I, I guess I'm resisting the notion that they're walking around feeling as if, oh, this place is terrible, it's all full of ruins, you know, some degree of ruined physical fabric um, becomes normalized, right? So you, you live and you don't see it in quite the same way. Um, but uh, yeah, but, but yeah, but I, I do think that there were different ways of, um, of um, using spaces. Uh, and the archaeology suggests that, you know, that there were different um, uh, kinds of uh, industries which came inside the city, um, like um, uh, near the Crypt of Balbi, for instance, you know, there were different kinds of tannery inside the city. Does that mean, yes, probably fewer people living there, but it's still being a used space. So I think the uses, uses are shifting. But, yeah. Great, that's a very good question. Yeah, thank you for it, uh, Giovanni. So. Yes, and uh, there are more questions or comments. Let's give a look. Uh, Rita, Rita, sì, Rita Lizzi. Ciao, ciao Michelle, how are you? Hi, how are thank you? you. <laughs> Lovely. Uh, thank you very much for your paper, your conference, and um, for your incoming book. It's coming now in August. Then um, I just uh, um, there is an aspect that um, probably you treated, but didn't speak about this that I want as well. Um, how much do you oh. think uh, that the popular elites cooperated with senatorial aristocrats in alliance with the military elites um, to the process that you illustrated? Popular elites, yes. right. Another chapter about uh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, thank you, thank you, Rita, for that question. Um, I. I do, did not want to um, go into that too much uh, here. I've kept you long enough, but I think uh, it's a, an important point. And it, um, I began by saying that you know, uh, senators could not survive without, without supporters, not elite supporters. Um, and so, uh, we hear about, um, we mostly hear about senators and supporters in times of physical violence when there are riots or, um, for example, in one of the letters of Cassiodorus, we hear about senators uh, sending in their, protecting their, their slaves and their supporters from legal action for rioting and, 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 um, uh, at the games. And they're not supposed to do that. So um, I, I think that um, each aristocratic senator had clients, um, slaves, um, as well as um, supporters in the city. Um, and they were necessary, both for the maintenance of uh, social status, as well as for um, physical security. Uh, there were bodyguards, certainly. There were bodyguards that everybody had, um, that, that, that individuals had. Um, so especially given the fact that Constantine had removed a Praetorian prefect, um, the Praetorian guard from the city in 312, the um, necessity for um, senator aristocrats to have their own protection, God, as it were, I think is real. Um, also, the, the urban populace could at any point 
um, riot or articulate their desires, um, either uh, in, in food riots uh, or by supporting one or other faction in a war. So I, I think that they were very much there, that their, their leadership um, would depend uh, on, on you know, who could sort of uh, articulate or, or use them. Um, so, for instance, um, uh, I begin with uh, Aurelian, who, when he came to Rome, uh, faced a, um, a riot uh, by workers at the Mint um, who didn't want to recognize him. And there is some evidence that these Mint workers had the support of certain senators who were also unhappy with Aurelian. They had also, the mint workers had also been involved in some kind of um, cutting of coins, uh, some financial uh, manipulation of some sort. Um, so there we can clearly see, uh, and just because our sources say that, that the mint workers and, and uh, were fighting with the support of senators against this incoming new emperor Aurelian. So we, we see them at time being activated, uh, but I think um, more generally, they are very much a concern, you know, feeding the people, keeping the people fed. <laughs> uh, food riots were a reality, a constant reality. And so senators were, you know, were responsible when there is urban prefects, especially, in making sure that the populace um, would not riot. You know, that's that's the, the control over um, civic order is a constant th uh, thread through both imperial legislation and um, the concerns articulated by various, uh, I guess urban prefects are primarily all the, all the in senatorial aristocrats in Rome whose job it was to make sure things were running. So that is really a constant concern. You know, if you give food to the people and maintain games, that's how you maintain law and order. And you see that the need to maintain law and order or security as a constant concern, which suggests that that is very much, um, that that kind of political support or that public, the people mattered, but it's manifested in different ways in our um, uh, by the concerns expressed by senators or emperors or the bishop, you know, to feed the people when right. when, when there's a food shortage, right? So that's that's always a, uh, another concern. Um, uh, but but in Rome, as you know, the expectation was by and large that the state would support that is the state, the urban prefect, um, who by the fifth century controls the prefect of the unknowner. So he has greater and greater responsibilities for that particular role. And of course, who becomes urban prefect, but always senatorial aristocrats. It's like the, one of the pinnacles of their career. And so that manifests the kind of honor that you, you um, want. So it's a very good point, but it, uh, yeah. I come about it from, from the perspective of you know, sort of maintaining that support, but there are certainly individual senators who have their own supporters. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Rita. There is uh, Mr. Chan, please. Yes. Uh, first of all, I want to say that I'm not a Roman historian, so my, my question is much broader. Uh, Thank you. Your proposal about the resilience of, of, the, of Rome meant, meant to me that it was important in establishing a foothold in, in a slower transition uh, to the barbarians to the north and the west that sustained a, enough stability for, for maintaining the transformation of Western civilization. If it sort of suddenly collapsed, it would seem that uh, it might have erase what might have been Rome in the past and not embedded in Western civilization to that degree. So it's, it seems to me it's a very important argument against this sort of more drastic collapse of the Roman empire. 
because being at least a period of transition allow uh, Europe, uh, the Western Empire to sustain the West, I should say the empire, to sustain itself long enough for a, a slower transition and therefore uh, perhaps, uh, uh, how to say, tame the more barbarian attitudes that might have existed. Uh, is that kind of your basic thing, uh, basic argument against the sudden collapse? Because that seemed rather important uh, for sustaining the Western civilization. Thank you for that um, very um, insightful way of thinking about it. And, and yes, partial, partially it is to slow down the movement is important. You know? And I think the way you framed it is very um, uh, helpful. Um, it is very much, um, my intervention very much is that it was um, a much longer process with um, ups and downs. <laughs> Um, and that the, resili the resurgence allowed for the, um, the integration to a certain degree of um, not just Christianity, but sort of Roman elite values um, into, uh, into the sort of Germanic framework, into the Germanic elites that would happen. Um, and, um, and also it is accounted to the narrative which many historians have adopted that it's, you know, that there are these turning points after which, after 410, everything stops. After 455 and the Vandal Sack, everything stops. And so it's very much accounted to this notion that there are cataclysmic events that transform the world. And I'm very much arguing that the transformation of the Roman Empire was a long drawn out process, which allowed for uh, these important institutional changes to survive and to influence the, um, the Germanic kingdoms for one, uh, Christianity, even the idea of um, you know, the Senate. Um, so, uh, and what, what, a, what is an aristocrat? You know, what, who, who, what kind of aristocrats? What, is an, what does a Christian aristocrat look like? Um, these ideals are you know, elites, these are ideals that sort of live on past the end of the political empire. But they do allow for these, um, yeah, it, it is slowing. Um, it is, my intervention, I hope, will slow down the desire. And I think it emphasizes also how um, agency matters. You know, there, you know, you know there, the, the attempt to see things all in terms of forces without individual actors was something that I was trying to work against. You know, that there are choices that, that groups do matter. And what's striking to me is that the Senate as an institution becomes a significant political player um, that will have um, ramifications uh, later later on. Especially. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, if there are not uh, any more questions or comments, I cannot see any. I thank again uh, very much uh, Michel Salzman and all participants, uh, colleagues and students. And now I, from my side, a good summer to all. And I leave, uh, I give the, the, the floor to Edward for, uh, for a greeting and some more uh, indications. Thank you, Giovanni. So uh, this is the, in a sense, the beginning of the summer break for the lectures on decline. So I'm posting the uh, schedule for the second half and we've reached the second, we've reached basically the halfway point of the seminar series. Yeah. Uh, and so we start up again in September with a lecture on September 3rd by Eric Robinson at Indiana University. Did classical Sparta decline and fall or just fall? Uh, and those lectures will continue for four months uh, and we will end with a 
extravaganza final lecture uh, on January 7th of 2022. So enjoy your summer and we look forward to seeing everybody when we come back in the, uh, in the fall. Oh, thank, thank you. you.